The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I've selected a translation of the Gospel that is not the one that you're used to here. Um, I'd like to read it. It's just a little easier. It's in more modern language. And it also gives the context a little better. So you can read that and listen to this. They're basically the same. As thousands of people crowded around Jesus and were stepping on each other, he told his disciples, I came to set fire to the earth, and I wish it were already on fire. I'm going to be put to a hard test, and I will have to suffer a lot of pain until it's over. Do you think that I came to bring peace to earth? No, indeed. I came to make people choose sides. A family of five will be divided, with two of them against the other three. Fathers and sons will turn against one another, and mothers and daughters will do the same. Mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law will also turn against each other. Jesus said to all the people, as soon as you see a cloud coming in the west, you say, it's going to get hot, and it does. Are you trying to fool someone? You can predict the weather by looking at the earth and sky, but you really don't know what's going on right now. The Gospel of Christ. Makes me feel very important when an awful lot of people come to help me out. <laughs> Today, the theme is the peace of Christ. What is the peace of Christ? During the season of Advent, before Christmas, there is a reading that we often hear from Isaiah the prophet that uh, described the Messiah that was about to come. And this is the reading, it's a bit of it. For us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Wonderful reading, eh? And that sets up Christmas. And in Christmas, we welcome the Prince of Peace. In John's Gospel, after Jesus rises from the dead on that first Easter in the evening, uh, we're told about the encounter that Jesus has with the disciples in the upper room. <clears throat> the very first thing he says, Peace be with you. And for those who are hard of hearing, he repeated it. Again, it says, he said, peace be with you. So it can be a little confusing, troubling to hear the gospel today. When Jesus says, do you think I came to bring peace? No. I came to bring division. A family of five will be divided with two of them against the other three. So, we've got a problem. Remember that movie? Houston, we got a problem. When the spacecraft was in trouble, we got a problem. Because Jesus has been set up prepared for hundreds of years to be understood as the Prince of Peace. And he speaks peace, his first words to the apostles and disciples in the upper room. Peace be with you, shalom, he's saying. And it means more than just that you feel free from fear. It means may everything in you 
be filled to overflowing. All your longings, all of the things you hope for, may they be realized. May wrinkles fade as I speak. May you receive a tummy tuck. May hair grow where before it was falling. It's that kind of thing. May you, may there be nothing in you that experiences anything less than joy and fullness. And then we have today's gospel, where we hear just the opposite. So I'm setting it up. Are you with me? We got a problem, okay? <clears throat> the scripture scholars suggest that in the early church, those who followed the way of Jesus, the way of nonviolent transformation of themselves and society, to be more just and more caring, to build up a sense of family, those who followed Jesus in the way came to a point often where in the synagogues, because they were Jewish, there was a conflict. They were saying these prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, and not everybody agreed with them. And at some point they said, you must leave. They were kicked out of synagogues. And there was a great deal of sadness and anguish and uncertainty and insecurity around that because the synagogue was really, in the Jewish society, the meeting place of the network of caring uh, relationships, so financially as well as emotionally. And they were kicked out. And then in families too, both Gentile and Jewish, those who followed Jesus often were told, we don't, by other members of the family, we don't necessarily believe this at all. And as far as we're concerned, you are no longer a member of this family. So when Jesus was saying this, the scripture scholars say, say he was trying, the, 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 in the early church when the gospels were being written, this is what was happening. People were suffering from being rejected and seen as evil and disruptive and that they're no longer welcome. And the pain of that, the suffering involved in that is expressed in this teaching that is saved in the Gospel of Luke. Luke spoke mainly to the uh, uh, Gentiles, eh? uh, and so it was happening in the Gentile community too, when people worshiped other gods or perhaps no god at all, and then they were converts to the, the Christian religion. So that it, they say that it expresses that sadness and that hurt. And even today, in our own families, those of us who go to church may be seen as losers or of another historical kind of epoch uh, and uh, not really with it and so on by many in society and in our own families. How many people ask us to pray when they're going through a difficult situation in our own families when they, they don't practice the faith? And that, that's painful, isn't it? That, that hurts when we see that. It hurts when we don't have them come to church with us. And we often wonder, whose fault is this? Well, it's happening everywhere. And the pain, though, is happening everywhere. So I think these words are, speak to that kind of hurt uh, that we suffer because of our faith. There is another kind of uh, false peace, too, that I think I'd like to talk about today. There is a false peace, and we all are familiar with it, uh, where we make an agreement, we may not have said it out loud, but we all agree not to talk about the elephant in the room. And we feel, well, that's a safer 
to do, isn't it? Because if we talked about the elephant in the room, there'd be trouble. Now that elephant may be daddy's drinking, it may be the church struggling to pay its bills, whatever it is. That's why the last few years it's been great that there's been a tri-parish uh, meeting in the three parishes in the cities talking about the elephant in the room, that all the three parishes have the same kind of struggle, meeting the pay payments say, every month, and uh, what are we going to do about it? Is there something we can do? Maybe God is calling us to something new here. Let's talk about it. So the false piece would be, let's not talk about it and pretend. Let's pretend that we're together every day, you know. And we just kind of go along and uh, as if nothing is wrong, as if nothing's happening. And yet we're all feeling it, but no one talks about it. Well, the peace that Jesus offers is a peace that also is willing to deal with those conflicts because it is the peace that is based on truth, the truth of the resurrection, that love is stronger than death, that death is not the end, that it's not over with death. And Christians have a foundational belief in that, that in, in the core of their being. And so, to have the peace of Christ means we have courage to talk about the elephant in the room, to face the truth. And then we experience the serenity that's involved in asking the question, well, are there things we can change and are there things we can't? You know the serenity prayer in the 12-step program, say? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. Well, that's what the peace of Christ is all about. Knowing the elephant in the room, the freedom to talk about it, and the courage to make those, that distinction between the things we can change and the things we can't. This past summer, the Anglican Church embraced and acknowledged uh, uh, up an issue at the National Congress, the Synod, rather, the National Synod, right? The blessing of same-sex marriages. And uh, should we talk about this? And is there a way uh, that we can continue to move forward in looking at the possibility of blessing such unions? It's divided our church, two-thirds, one-third. It's almost like reading this, eh? Two will be divided against one. It's, uh, it's divided our church. It's, it's a problem, it's a challenge. But I think it's wonderful that we could talk about it. Whew, what a relief. We're talking about the, the challenge, the elephant in the room. And we're doing something about it. And I think it was providential, I don't know if you know about the voting, eh? One night, everybody went to bed thinking we were going to go one direction, then the next night we did a recount and we are going to go in the other direction. So everybody could say to everybody else on both sides of the issue, I know exactly how you feel. And because of that, we can be a community because we can gather around the table of the Lord and say, we stand one uh, with each other around the Lord's table, but we don't see eye to eye on certain issues. And that's just fine, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been in the church. And uh, so I think that's a strength, a wonderful strength of our church, the Anglican community. I'll end with this. You ready for an ending? <laughs> Last Friday on Facebook, and I'm showing my age here because <clears throat> at 69, I'm on Facebook. I think that's a miracle. Anyway, Matt Martin, who many of you know is the Elvis impersonator, the Anglican priest who does an Elvis impersonation, 
he sang here, he sang at our church, St. Hill of St. Luke's and many other places. He is the rector of Holy Trinity in Lucan. And last Friday, Father Martin put this up on his Facebook page. I'm going to read it to you. I felt a real blessing with it. He said, The older I get, the more I realize we have but one opportunity to make this journey count. Do you want me to read on? Here it comes! <laughs> Today is the day I can stand up and be a voice for the voiceless. Today, I can listen to those who cannot be heard and look out for those who feel invisible. Today is the day I can live out my faith because it is faith that speaks of love for all and showers me with hope. Think of that morning shower. Showers me with hope, so much hope. I'm going to make today a good day. That is an expression of healthy, mature Christian faith. And it makes every day a day that is possible for transformation, possible for joy, possible for connecting with people and helping them to understand that we're all part of the same family. We are brothers and sisters. And we don't have to wait to enjoy the benefits of that. It can happen right now. Copies of this will be available. <laughs> For only $4 a month. No. So let's profess our faith, the faith prayer. Thank you for spelling my name right. That was great. <laughs> Do we have a faith prayer that we can put up? Okay. So let's stand and profess our faith. I give my heart to you, God the Almighty. Make of all this, also.